Father, may you quiet our hearts. May every word we say be blessed by your spirit. May it be practical to our lives. Father, may we leave here today having a better understanding of who you are. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And if you are wondering how I wound up in 2 Kings on a Thanksgiving Sunday, I can say with a clear conscience that I did not. This is a God thing. The good Lord, he, uh, he smiled this morning. And uh, he said, I think you should talk about Naaman. And I'm like, well, what is there about Thanksgiving that has to do with Naaman? And so the good Lord, he has to humble me often. So if you have a Bible, there should be one in the chair in front of you. Or Most of us anymore have Bible apps on our cell phones. Um, whatever you need to do. Um, I'm going to be doing some reading this morning from 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, just to kind of give you an overview on the very top of your little hand out there, Naaman was a great military leader of the most powerful nation on earth, but he had leprosy. And that demanded a supernatural kind of healing, the most feared disease of his day. It was highly contagious, and it was incurable. Back in that day, if you had leprosy, as soon as people found out, you were cast out. You, were, you couldn't associate with people because it was so contagious, and people are terrified of it. You have an idea of what that's like. And so, but this was, people that had it had to put bells on their clothes. They'd have little bells, and if they were moving through an area where there was people, they would have to yell, unclean, unclean. And it was terrible. And they didn't have any concept on that day of what leprosy was. They didn't know how it was contracted, and, you know, and it was disfiguring. It was grotesque. And if you were a leper, your, fanish, your family would banish you, and you would never the rest of your life be welcome back. It was a terrible thing. And the greatest general on the face of the earth had leprosy. This is not a happy guy. So look at verse 1 of chapter 5. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories, but though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Man, do you get the, the echo in the background of that verse? Here's one of the greatest commanders on the face of the planet, a leader of men, excelled in every facet of his life, but he had leprosy. How often in our lives, no matter how on the ball we are, no matter how good we are at our jobs, no matter how good we are with our family, no matter, there's a thing. There's a thing that humbles us. There's a thing that we cannot get control of. There's something in our life that just overshadows success. Verse 2, at this time, our, our uh, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel. Among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. Do not, by the way, on the back page of your little hand out there, flip your little paper over. On the back, I just give you one little paragraph. I called it the slave girl. Notice her name is never mentioned. She is like the heart of this story. She is, the whole thing focuses around her, and they don't even have her name. Of course, back in them days, when you were taken a slave... They, they got to name you. Whatever name you had at home is no longer your name. So your new owners would name you. And so here, she's a little Israeli gal, a little Hebrew. says, on my hand out there on the back, but God uses ordinary people. This little gal didn't have to tell Naaman about Elisha, the preacher back in Israel. She didn't have to do that. You came into my country, you beat up my government, you beat up our temples, you beat up our people, and you took me captive to a foreign land as a little girl. She, didn't have, she could have just sat there with her mouth shut. Would that have been a sin? <laughs> it says, after all, she had her own problems. She'd been snatched away from her home when she was a small girl. She would never see her family again. Still, and don't get this, still she was concerned about the well-being of her master. God expects his kids, you and me, to always be ready to help others. I took a, some leadership classes, and one of the instructors came down. He said, the greatest aspect of leadership is availability. 
Availability. He said, you lead whatever comes up. Whatever the situation, whatever the need, wherever you're at, you be available. He said, true leaders don't get to pick and choose. True leaders stand up when there's a need and they meet that need. And here, we got this little gal who is ready to help her master who conquered her and brought her back. Gave her to his wife as a slave. If there was anybody that had a reason to be rebellious, it's her. If there's anybody that had a reason to be resentful, <laughs> yeah, it's her. If I was her pastor and she came to me and says, look what this people did, look what Naaman did, look what he did to me, look what's happening in my life, I would be sympathetic to her. I'd say, well, we should pray. Yeah, maybe God will smack Naaman around. So anyway, the lesson I gave you with her is often we must look past our own issues and see the pain in others. Remember I told you Thanksgiving is all about others. Thanksgiving is all about meeting the needs of those that God, I call it divine interventions, where God brings somebody into your path. 2 Kings chapter 5, let's go to verse 3. So one day, the girl said to her mistress, Naaman's wife, I wish my master, Naaman, would go see the prophet in Samaria and he would heal him of leprosy. Okay, two quick thoughts. I can only be serious for so long. One, there's no cure for leprosy. And two, you send somebody to me to, for me to cure them of COVID or AIDS, pick the disease of the month. I am not going to be happy with you. I'm not going to be. So this little gal is volunteering to send her master back into Israel to the pastor to have him healed of leprosy of which there's no healing. Yeah. She would not be popular in my book. I would not be happy with her. So verse four, so Naaman told the king what the little girl from Israel had said. Pause. Kind of do a, you know, drone view of this story. You know what I'm taking out of this when I read this? This little girl had some amazing folks. This little gal had parents that loved the Lord. This little gal had parents that walked with God. And she saw what that looked like. And as a little girl being snatched out of her home, serving in the, in the home of a pagan, she is faithful to what she believes. She, oh, Proverbs, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, she will not depart from it. She is a little slave girl with no name, is honored for all eternity in the word of God. Because she's faithful. She is following in the footsteps of her mama and her dad, who showed her what living as a Christian is supposed to look like. And they said, follow in our steps. And that's what she's doing here. She has faith. Do you imagine the level of faith it would take for a little girl? Take your daughter to look and say, there's a God in Israel. There's a God with healing. That is a reflection of the folks. Ah, keep going. Verse 5. The king, now the king, <laughs> if the king don't like you, you know, you lose your head. So the king looks at Naaman, his favorite general, and says, go visit the prophet. And I will send a letter of introduction for you to, make, uh, to take to the king of Israel. Okay, now, it, I don't care if you're the prophet that this guy's going to, or the king of Israel. Israel had already just been whooped by this guy once. All right. This guy's already beat up Israel. And so now a letter is going to go from the victor king to the defeated king and say, I'm sending my favorite guy to your office and I want you to heal him. Have your pastor heal him. I imagine the king sitting there going, all right, 2021. It can't get worse than this. <laughs> this is, oh Lord, <laughs> this is just, what are we going to do? Yeah, so then we keep going. So it says, so Naaman started out carrying gifts, 750 pounds of silver. Now just pause here for a second. When people come before God, by the way, as a pastor, I find this highly entertaining. When people want something from God, they think they've got to buy his favor. Do you know how many people tell me, pretty much on a weekly basis, you know, I'm going to come out and visit your church, but first, I have to. First, I, I need to, first... They, they, people intuitively believe that they got to impress God. 
They, and they, for some reason, they think he can't see them out there. He can only see them in here. They're in some kind of cloak out there. But when they come in here, into the tent of meeting, all of a sudden they're, oh, their hearts are exposed. How silly is that? God knows us. He wired us. He understands our hearts, our desires, our motives. He knows these things. And what he wants when we walk through those doors, when we don't walk through those doors, when you're at home, you know what he wants? Two things. Honesty and humility. He wants honesty and humility. That's all he wants. He doesn't want you to say some flowery prayer that's going to impress him. Truth is, half the time when I pray, I'm like, God, uh, it's a mess. It's a mess down here. It's like a whole train hit our little nation, and now I'm a bystander. I'm rubbernecking, watching the disaster. I'm just asking that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there come, and now I'm little rabbit trail. There comes a time in your heart where you recognize that God allows things to happen to a nation to draw people back to himself. Never forget this. God is more interested in the souls of people than he is the success of nations. God would much rather have people turning their hearts to him in honesty and humility than for us to be some great superpower that has no use for God, that denies God and moves away from him. In the Old Testament, the Bible repeatedly says, and God raised up the Babylonians to smack down his people. Why? Because he loves his people too much to allow them to wallow in sin. God loves his people too much to allow them to stay in darkness. He says, I am not going to continue to bless people who are choosing to walk in the dark, to walk away from me. Why? Because I love them. What does the Bible say? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God, who is not restricted by time, is willing to take generations to work in the hearts of people and nations to bring them back to himself. Here we see where Naaman thinks if he wants God's attention, he's going to have to pay for it. So the question is, on your little handout on the front, Third little thing, fourth little thing down. But we can't earn God's favor. Let me keep reading here. I'm a little ahead. And so uh, verse, verse 6, the letter of the king to Israel said, with his letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of leprosy. No pressure. Larry, you just take care of that. All right, verse 7. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, am I God that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. Okay, I love that, because that's what I would have thought. That's exactly what I would have said. Verse 8, and then Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay. He sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. And as a pastor, I read that verse, and I cannot describe the level of humility that I experience. I want to stand up, not, not as a reflection of the church and you, or not a reflection on my reputation, because this is God's reputation. He says, send him here, and this is going to reflect back on God. If that pastor knows God well enough that with confidence he can say, God's going to heal the unhealable, this is a guy that walks with God on a daily basis. So keep moving here. So what's that? Verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. Verse 10. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go wash yourself seven times on the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. Verse 11. Naaman became angry, stalked away. So by the way, I'm going to give you a pastoral footnote here. When people take offense at what I do, in what I believe. I like that. Because when they are angry, I know the Spirit of God is working in their hearts. The ones I struggle with are those that don't care. The ones I struggle with that totally disagree with me, but they just don't care. They're like, 
Believe what you believe. I believe what I believe. We agree to disagree. Fine. But you still got to deal with the Word of God. You still have to deal with Jesus. You're still going to have to figure out who Jesus is and how he's going to relate to your life. And when people get mad, I assume that is God's Spirit moving in their heart, demanding change, demanding repent, demanding whatever he's demanding in there. And when we rub people into change, it always makes them mad. Here, God's working in Naaman's heart, and he's mad. Naaman says, I thought he would certainly come out to meet me. I expected him to wave his hands over my leprosy and call in the name of the Lord as God and heal me. I like that. He's like, I want him to beat a drum. I want him to clam some cymbals. I want him to wave his hands. I want him to say some magic words. You know, this is going to be a, a, I demand pomp and circumstance. If I had to do over, I'd write pomp and circumstance in my Bible. He is demanding what? Recognition of his greatness, not his greatness. His. He wants attention. He wants God to recognize who he is and what he brings to the table. Oh, how horrible is this? All right, keep going. Verse 12. Aren't the rivers of Damascus and Abana and Pafar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned away in a rage. He is mad. Why? <laughs> yes. He isn't getting any... He is a great man, and he wants everybody to know he's a great man. It's all about me. It's a, amen. It's all about me. And if I can tell you a story I've told you before, when I first started being a pastor out here, I counseled a lot of people, and 100% of them ignored me. Not one of them did what I told them to do. I found that very discouraging. I was shocked at first. I was like, they come to me for advice, I give them advice, and then they go home and they ignore me. So finally, my wife sends me to a counselor in Spokane that worked for Moody Bible Institute. And, uh, and uh, I said, Dave, here's my problem. And he says, I know the, he said, I can fix this. I said, okay. He said, Shane, you are not God. Now, my wife works the counter, give her $100 as you leave. That's my fee. <laughs> he thought he was funny, but he was serious. He was $100 for the advice. Shane, you're not God. Naaman thought he was quite a ways up the pecking order, quite a ways up the food chain. Sometimes we have to be knocked off our pedestal. That is the gospel truth. If you are a leper and they still allow you to function as the most powerful general of the army, clearly you have influence. You've got some juice somewhere, at least your body parts start falling off. It's kind of hard to ignore it at that point. Um, so, verse 13. So, but his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do some very difficult thing, wouldn't you have done it? Ooh, that hurts. Hmm? A quest. Yeah, if you give him a quest, say, you know, you got to take the ring up on the volcano and throw it in the, you know, you, know, you got to do some terrible thing. Yeah, you're, you're going to be excited to do it because it's all about me. That's why Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace... Are we saved through faith? Not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works. What, that's 100% true. Not of works because I can't brag about it. It is a gift of God. Only God gets a credit. That's what God's trying to drive home in this passage. Naaman, this is not about you. This is about him. And you are missing that. And his, even his guys that work for him, his lieutenants and his captains, majors, they're like, guy, go get in the water. Quit being a fool. So what does he say? Verse 14. So Naaman went down in the Jordan River, dipped himself seven times as a man of God had instructed him, and his skin became healthy as a skin of a young child, and he was healed. Now, right in the middle of the front page on your handout, I gave you a thought, and I'm still processing this thought, because I think this is, I think this actually has layers of truth. On the front page, right in the middle, God doesn't fit in our box. Now we're bordering on dealing with denominations. We're dealing with... Start. People assume that God can only work in one way. I want to tell you something. God loves people. He will not tolerate sin. But He loves people. And He will not tolerate sin. And He works in individuals. He works in different individuals' lives differently. 
don't miss that. Naaman had a priest. Where do you think Naaman learned this? Naaman knew what he knew about God from his gods from when he grew up in the temples that he frequented. They did this. You brought, you brought enough money to your pastor and he would give you a blessing. Doesn't work here. Let that go. Um, where he grew up, the more money you brought, the bigger the blessing. You wanted a huge blessing. Bring the pastor a lot of money and he will dump out the windows of heaven. On, well, that's pagan. God says, I want you to be humble and honest with me. I want you to come in here and say, I am not worthy. I just want God's love. I want to experience the love of God in my life that transforms me, changes my heart, changes my mind, rewires me and teaches me how to think how he wants me to think. We call that living by faith. We got to beware when we put God in a box. Naaman refused to follow the prophet's instructions because he was received by a servant and his, and by the way, this last thing, you want to talk about church politics, the dark side of church politics, it's that last line. Naaman's expectations were not met. Naaman had expectations. And when people come into the house of God with their own expectations and their own pet preferences, it's easy to superimpose them over the Word of God. If your expectations are routed in the Word of God, then you and I are in lockstep. Because I try really hard to make sure what I believe and what I teach from this pulpit is 100% rooted in the Word of God. So what we need to do, by the way, that's why it says in Peter, what does it say? It says, be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you a question. If somebody asks you, why do you believe this? You should be able to say, well, the Bible says. Yes! Often after funerals, people will come up to me. <laughs> I, I did a funeral in Colville, I don't know, a decade ago. And this guy comes up to me and he, he says, I don't believe anything you said today. And I says, here's the problem. I said, everything I told you today, I can open my Bible and show you verse by verse what God said. He says, what do you base as your authority on what you believe? It's that simple. I told him, I says, I told him, I said, you need to realize, sir. I said, out of all kindness, this is not between you and me. I said, this is between you and God's word. You need to look at God's word and figure out if what your expectations are, what your beliefs are, what you're comfortable believing is consistent with what it says in the word of God. Challenge accepted. So he went and got on his plane. I never heard from him again. Um, so verse 15, you're going to have to go home and read the rest of this on your own. Great story about how Naaman went back to reward Elisha. And, you know, that didn't turn out so pretty good for the servant. Um, I want to tell you something. When you read this, I want you to, right on the bottom of the front page, it says, we cannot bargain with God. We come, when I do this with kids, I teach this story, I like to turn my pockets inside out and say, when I come to God in prayer, I got nothing in my pockets. When I come to God to serve, I got nothing in my pockets. When I stand up here to preach, I pull out my pocket, I got nothing in my pockets. I am here strictly as his mouthpiece. I am here strictly to be very careful with what I teach from his word. When I get up here, I want the Spirit of God, to take the Word of God and make life change. I want, <coughs> here's my, my objective as your pastor. When you walk out those doors, I want you to have a little better understanding of who God is and how He works than when you come in the door. This, this is all about who God is and what God expects of His people. This is all about what God demands. And I hope you do not miss that. So flip your little paper over on the back. The very bottom, Elisha. I want to tell you, Elisha is a fascinating guy. Elisha was aware of who Naaman was. Elisha was aware of the impact all this had on the king. But Elisha knew one more thing that you cannot leave here by missing. Elisha knew God. And there's where the power lies. Not in the fact the president smiled on him. Not in the fact that the most powerful king on the face of the earth had a request and wanted something from him. Elisha 
knew that he was who he was because he knew God. Elisha did not receive Naaman in the way everybody else would have power. No pomp and circumstance, no secret service, no bells, no trumpets playing. No. People around us, and don't miss this, people around us should know that we honor and serve a God who is far greater than anyone or anything on this planet. We need to love God and love Him supremely, whatever the cost. So then I gave you a thought. How do we get to know God that way? By refusing anyone or anything permission to occupy God's rightful place in our lives. And if you want to know more about that, you've got to come back another Sunday. That's a whole study unto itself. The lesson on this whole thing, right at the bottom, Elisha wanted Naaman to know that nobody is above God. And that, my friends, that is the Word of God. Back up. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Man, Dad, would you please close?